to save your soul from death But it's all works righteousness, you know Can I manufacture grace for self-denial in some religious place By weeping hard on your face or saying prayers to some dead saints, you know It's not through creeds a little cheese Self-flagellation till you bleed A secret vows that you can't keep Mysteries and visions when you dream It's never a way that you must come To the Father through the Son Loving Him more than other loves Family, friends, yourself and a one By grace alone Through faith alone Today I want to deal with a contrast that is quite difficult and it is with some trauma that I come to it because I know how painful it is to a Catholic person, particularly a devout Catholic. It's the contrast between what scripture says about Christ Jesus being full of grace and truth as our Savior and as the one to whom we look and what the Catholic Church says about Mary being full of grace and um, difficult because in the United States and worldwide the average ordinary Catholic is really held to the Catholic Church by the teachings of Mary. Most of the prayers in the Catholic Church are to Mary, like Hail Mary, full of grace. You start off that prayer by calling her full of grace and you pray for her as the mother of God. Pray for us. Uh, uh, you say at the end of the prayer, you calling her the mother of God. And that's the most said prayer. At the end of the rosary, Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, Hail our life, our sweetness and our hope. Your hope, your sweetness is in Mary. And the famous prayer, the Memorare, Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone fled to thy protection. Implore thy aid or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, I fly unto thee, Virgin of Virgins, my mother, to thee I call. Uh, you come to her as one who never fails to answer prayer. The implication is that the Father of Christ Jesus may fail, but she never fails to answer prayer. And so it's a difficult topic. Most churches, the Catholic churches, are dedicated in some way in their name to Mary far more than any other name. Uh, in the Catholic Church are the different churches dedicated to Mary. But we had highlighted last year, and that is 90 or 2004, we had highlighted the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception because in 2004 was the anniversary 150 years since the dogma was first of all proclaimed in the Catholic Church. So it was a huge event in 2004. The eyes of the world were turned to the Vatican where different statements were made about the Immaculate Conception and to Lourdes, a city in southern France where it is purported and claimed that on March the 25th, 1855, Mary, as is said, appeared to a peasant girl called Bernadette Subrius and announced, I am the Immaculate Conception. The Pope at the time took this as a verification of the dogma he had published 
previously, 1854, on Mary being immaculate and full of grace. And he took that apparition to be a confirmation or verification of what he did four years previously. And so that's where we get the date, 1854, 150 years after 1854 was 2004. And so the great celebrations took place in 2004 to look to Mary as, as um, full of grace, the Immaculate Conception, and to look to her in answer to prayer and in the different ways in which she is called to be the cause of salvation of somebody who is desiring salvation. So it's not just that in 2004 there was superlative emphasis on Mary. This is commonplace. And if you turn to the Catechism of the Catholic Church and go to paragraph uh, 2677, you will find that there on the pages of the official teaching of the Catholic Church already was superlative veneration of Mary. Quotation from that paragraph of the New Catechism says the following, by asking Mary to pray for us, we acknowledge ourselves to be poor sinners and we address ourselves to the Mother of Mercy, the All-Holy One. End of quotation. Mary is superlatively called the All-Holy One. Now the Catholic Church recognizes that God is the All-Holy One. Of course it does. But it now declares that there is another All-Holy One and there's no footnote or disclaimer to explain how you can have a human creature who's also called the All-Holy One. But what was celebrated in 2004 was the fact that Mary was full of grace, completely sinless, and that she was conceived immaculately. And I'd like to read from the official teaching of the Catholic Church, quoting again from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, official words. <clears throat> I'm quoting, first of all, from paragraph 493, quotation. Throughout the centuries, the Church has become ever more aware that Mary, full of grace, yeah through God, was redeemed from the moment of her conception. That is what the dogma of the Immaculate Conception confesses, as Pope Pius IX proclaimed in 1854. The Most Blessed Virgin was, from the first moment of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. That's the end of that official quotation. In the same catechism, we have a bigger part, and that was 491. In 493, we have the second quotation. That was 491, 493, the quotation. By the grace of God, Mary remained free from every personal sin her whole life long. So not only was she conceived, she never had original sin according to the Catholic Church. She was full of grace from the moment of her conception. But she never committed any personal sin in her life. Now, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception is dealing with Mary and not her birth but her conception. So some Bible believers will say, oh, well I believe in the Immaculate Conception, meaning that you're talking about the virgin birth. This is not talking about the virgin birth. It's not talking about any birth as such. It's talking about Mary's conception in the womb of her mother. So it's the, it's the beginning 
of the life of Mary in the womb of her mother. That's what's spoken about. So it's, it's important to get the concept in our mind. Of course we hold to the virgin birth, but this is not what's been spoken of. It is the conception of Mary in the womb of her mother. And because of this, she's called full of grace, that she always had the plenitude of grace because she was conceived without sin. Now the reference they give for this, they say that we get the term full of grace from Luke chapter 1 verse 28. Now if you read the, the Dawe Bible and some of the old traditional Catholic Bibles, they use the word full of grace to translate the word highly favored one. But it is interesting that the, the more modern Catholic Bibles like the, um, the one that is commonly used here in the United States, the New American Bible, that it correctly translates that verb, that the, the, the word kekarikatomene in Greek, it trans translates it correctly. The New American Catholic Bible says, And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. And while this Catholic Bible has it correctly translated, the Catholic teaching mistranslates it as full of grace. And they continue to say that she is full of grace. It's not that she's highly favored as are all God's people. Anyone who is uh, called of God and becomes a believer on Christ Jesus is called highly favored because they are recipient of grace in that sense. They're highly favored of God as was Mary in that sense. But they have a different concept to say that she was full of grace and it's a totally different concept. And so quoting again from the Catholics of the Catholic Church, now paragraph 508, quotation, From among the descendants of Eve, God chose the Virgin Mary to be the mother of his son, full of grace. Mary is the most excellent fruit of redemption. From the first instant of her conception, she was totally preserved from the stain of original sin and remained pure from all personal sin throughout her life. End of quotation. So this concept that Mary is full of grace is central to Catholicism. So central that that prayer Hail Mary, full of grace. That's the most common prayer. It's said 50 times in the rosary. And it's the most said prayer. If a person goes to confession, they might get three Hail Marys or what, and you begin Hail Mary, full of grace. This concept that is central to Catholicism is not in the Bible. Amen. It's not highly favored one. It's a different concept that she was totally full of grace. Now why is that so difficult? Because the scripture speaks about one who is full of grace. And this is our Savior. Amen. And if you hold to another full of grace, you are taking from his office who is full of grace and truth. And this makes it really difficult and in such a way that you cannot accept it because what you know what the scriptures say about him who is full of grace. The scripture says he dwelt among us full of grace and truth. The words of the Apostle John. And John continues, of his fullness we have received grace for grace. Because Christ Jesus is full of grace we have received from him grace for grace. We have gone to the source, the one source of him who is full of grace. And this is where the uh, truth lies. 
And the same the Apostle Paul tells us, and it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That it was the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So scripture keeps telling us of the fullness of grace in Christ Jesus. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so, yes, there is one full of grace. And that is Christ Jesus. Full of grace and truth. And it is really nothing less than blasphemy to say that a human creature is full of grace and utterly sinless. Because that is to hold up before people another one who is absolutely perfect before the all-holy God. And the scripture only knows one, and that was Christ Jesus, the one mediator between God and man. So it is difficult, and it is actually difficult, because we should all have a great respect for Mary, the biblical Mary. The pages of scripture say that she is blessed among women and forever. And the greatest model we have as a, for a believer is Mary, for men and for women. The way she stood at the foot of the cross, the way she prayed uh, at the day of Pentecost, the way she stood you know, with the Lord, and even in our doubts she kept trusting in the one who was her son. You know, we have a remarkable remarkable demonstration of what it is to be a true believer and so she is truly blessed among women uh, blessed among the people of God and in that way we can thank God for the biblical Mary such a model for all of us but she's blessed among women she's not blessed on a par with God Amen. and that's where this is an insult to her person as a believer. It's an insult to her because she clearly pronounced the fact that she was a saved sinner. In the famous prayer of Mary called the Magnificat that's recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, 46 and 47, she said, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoiceth in God my... Savior. She recognized that she had a Savior. And only saved sinners recognize the fact that they have a Savior. If she was immaculately conceived, she didn't need a Savior. So this is an insult to the biblical Mary. And Mary was a wonderful believer. She, as a virgin, brought forth Christ Jesus, as we know, and cared for him brought him up together with Joseph the foster father of Christ Jesus but she married Joseph and was the mother to their children and so the scripture keeps telling us about the brothers and sisters of the Lord for example in Matthew chapter 13 verse 55 it says is his mother not called Mary his brothers James, Jose, Simon and Judas. And that's only one of many passages where the names are given of the brothers and sisters. So she was a remarkable believer and she's a remarkable example of a married woman bringing up her children in the fear and nurture of God. And we thank God that the Lord's brothers after his resurrection came to believe like James. So is you know his um, half brothers so this was this is remarkable and the scripture is clear why is it that the Catholic Church holds her as full of grace and to say that she had no other children that she had taken a vow of celibacy and so had Joseph that they would not have any sexual intercourse why is that? Because Mary is held up before priests and nuns and is an example of somebody leading a life of celibacy. And the model doesn't exist. Mary was an example of a married woman. 
and uh, praise God for her as a great example to married women. Amen. But um, it's really an insult to her to hold her up as a model for virgins and for those who go into the convent. We have a video of Mary Ann Packy saying that she went into the convent to become a bride of Christ and it's, it's really horrific to see what happened to her in the convent. And uh, she had her eyes open to the realities of life in the convent. Young, devout women wanting to be like Mary as a virgin whereby Mary was an example of what it is to be a married woman. So difficult but it's got to be faced because these are very real everyday problems and we still have a lot of young girls going in to the convent life right across the world even with the difficulties and the falling away of many sisters uh, from, the, from being nuns and I praise God that some of them have become Bible believers Amen. we have a book called The Truth Set Us Free 20 nun, Former Nuns Tell Their Stories it is one of the most remarkable books most of those nuns are former Americans and their contemporaries with the exception of two Eileen Donnelly who very recently died and one other who had died previously they're all alive and very well and great proclaimers of the truth and I have Amen. done uh, videos with some of these former nuns and but other nuns just leave and they leave with destitute because they just couldn't find anything in the convent life and they leave forlorn and some of them you know get into drugs and all types of immorality when they leave the convent and some of course immor immorality in the convent so it's a difficult life and Mary is not the model of, of being a virgin. She was a married woman. Amen. So this idea of Mary as full of grace is just not biblical and it takes from the office of Christ Jesus. But they go further as we saw earlier on in paragraph 2677. She is called the All Holy One. Now why is this so serious? Because on the pages of scripture the All Holy One is mentioned. There is only one aspect of God that is repeated three times in the pages of scripture and that is His holiness. Isaiah says holy, holy, holy is the Lord the thrice holy one Amen. who shall not fear thee O Lord and glorify thy name for thou only art holy the attribute that distinguishes God from all other creatures is his holiness it distinguishes God so that his truth is holy his justice is holy his love is holy the distinctive attribute that makes God distinct from all other beings is the fact that he alone is the all holy one it's the reason why we need to be saved before the all holy God and so important is this that it is the key attribute to distinguish God from everything else that he has made and so it is said there is none holy as the Lord none like thee there's only one who is the all holy one now to say that Mary is the all holy one is really putting idolatry at the extreme level where you're looking on her like she had a divine attribute yep. and the Catholic Church does hold to the Trinity but in this declaration it's like it's taking, taking from the doctrine of the Trinity because if there is another all holy one you are 
really getting into the fact that well then we should address ourselves to her that means we should pray to her and any prayer is recognition so that it is veneration or worship when you recognize someone as being the, the all holy one that recognition is the beginning of worship so that's where it is really dangerous grounds so it is really really serious who shall not fear thee, O Lord, or glorify thy name, for thou only art holy, and all nations shall come and worship before thee. Revelation 15, verse 4. So that is not biblically possible, because there is none holy as the Lord. And it has got to be said that you cannot hold this teaching because of who God is in his most distinguished attribute his holiness that there is only one who is the all holy one but it's also said about Mary is that she is the cause of salvation not only is she alleged to be the all holy one but she is alleged to be the cause of salvation according from the catechism paragraph 494 Quotation, as St. Irenaeus says, being obedient, she became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. End of quotation. So she was the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. Now this affects an ordinary Catholic where they live, that if Mary is the cause of salvation well then you pray to her and you look to her and it is that you have a another source by which you can be right with God now that is a lie and it's a damnable lie because the scripture says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but should have everlasting life we look to God as the cause of salvation there's no other cause of salvation except the love of God to choose us and to give us faith in Christ Jesus as the one who is full of grace there's no other cause and it's not a human person and this is quite difficult but it is it is it's got to be faced and we have to face it forthrightly because it is not simply that the Catholic Church calls her the all holy one and full of grace and the cause of salvation they also call her by other titles she is called the Mediatrix, a feminine mediator. And this is paragraph 969 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I want to read that paragraph. Taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside the saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of, of eternal salvation. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the Church under the titles of Advocate, Helper, Benefactress, and Mediatrix. So, two things are said there primarily, that she continues her saving office. What was said, that she is the cause of salvation, she continues it in heaven so she still has a saving office she's still in the business of saving people and bringing them the gifts of eternal salvation direct, direct words from the Catholic Church but then she is invoked and it gives a list of titles and the last one is mediatrix it is the word for a feminine mediator so in scripture it says there's one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus so that is 1 Timothy 2 5 but in the Catholic Church is another one a feminine one and who is the cause of salvation 
and still as an office of salvation. So you have a feminine uh, media tricks, likewise. Now, simple mathematics is one and one make two. You know, so if, if, if you hold to the scripture and it says one mediator, it's easy, you, you don't go to two. Yeah. But in the Catholic Church, they do go to two. And they are so bold as to quote 1 Timothy 2, 5 and say, Mary's mediation does not take from, but rather enhances Christ's mediation. The very opposite of what it does. Because if people are looking to her, they're not looking to him. And it's taken for him. So they are so bold in Vatican II documents to say it enhances, it doesn't take from the role of Christ as one mediator. It rather magnifies it or enhances it. It's exactly opposite. Because it does take away from and see Catholic lives who are bound up in the veneration of Mary their lives are not looking to Christ, they're looking to Mary. But it is really serious to see the other titles in that paragraph 969. She's also called the titles of Advocate, Helper and Benefactress. Why is this so serious? The Bible speaks about another advocate. Christ Jesus is the advocate, there's another one who would come after him, the Holy Spirit is given as the second advocate to be with us forever. It is a divine title of Christ Jesus and of the Holy Spirit and not of any human person. So Mary is called advocate and similarly she is called helper and benefactress. The Holy Spirit is our helper and our guide and our benefactor supremely to lead us into all truth, to convict us of sin, righteousness and judgment. So these titles are all titles either of Christ Jesus, the mediator, or of the Holy Spirit. So you've taken divine titles and given them to a human creature. Now, how more serious can you get? How more unbiblical can you get? It, you cannot get more unbiblical than this. This is the zenith of going against what Scripture says. I know this is painful, and I ask any devout Catholic listening that you would really know that I'm trying to say this with compassion and empathy. Because I was a Catholic for 48 years. I prayed the rosary. I prayed, remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection and brought thy aid or sought thy intercession and the prayer that I quoted earlier on. I know that by heart because I said it and meant it. I said the Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, Hail Our Life and all the other Catholic prayers and meant them. And I know how painful it was to me to study scripture and to see that there was one mediator and one advocate and one benefactor. And so if this is difficult for you, I ask you to pray that you would get over the pain and that you would just ask God to alleviate your pain so that you would see the biblical truth and that you would accept the fact that there is only one All-Holy One, there's only one mediator Besides Christ Jesus, there's only one other advocate, that's the Holy Spirit. And he is the helper and the benefactor to lead us into all truths. And that these titles cannot be given to a human creature. It is difficult, and I ask that you really bear with me because of the difficulties that is involved in all of this. This is highly difficult and highly dangerous because if you get into venerating Mary and praying to Mary you see where it leads to. An example of this was the late Pope John Paul II and what he did officially as Pope. 
on October the 8th in the year 2000. He consecrated the whole world and the new millennium that was coming in in the year 2000 to Mary Most Holy. That was his official words in dedicating the world and this millennium that was to come from the year 2000 in onwards to Mary Most Holy. In doing that, he was breaking the first commandment because there shall be no other God besides the one true God. We do not hold up any other as most holy because there's only one. And in leading people to consecrate their lives to Mary like he was consecrating the whole world to Mary, he was leading people into communion with the dead, which it is called in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that you commune with and talk to dead saints and then particularly to Mary, that you address yourself in prayer to her. This is really an avenue or a pathway into the occult. And it is really sad because that's where it leads to. It is not something I'd like you to do, but you may want to do it. If you go on the internet and go to the different goddess web pages, and there are many of them, you will see that Mary is included among the goddesses. For example, Spiral Goddess Grove is a famous goddess site on the internet. White, the White Moon is the name of another web page, and Goddess 2000 is the name of another famous web page. And on these web pages, it shows that Mary, the Mother of God, is part of the worship that is given to the World Mother. I'm quoting from the um, web page the white moon when you pray to Mary mother of Jesus you pray without knowing it to the world mother in one of our many forms so this idea of a goddess that is mother earth that so many people are getting into you see some bumper stickers you know mother earth and coming to mother earth and then getting into praying to World Mother is just an avenue into the occult. And it is interesting that when you go to cultic web pages, that they include Mary, the mother of Jesus, in their web pages. And it's not only frightening, and I ask that if you go there that you really pray for the Lord's protection, you know, because it's, it's, it's a dangerous place to be. And it's, it's dangerous not only for adults, for children. Some of these web pages have sections for children where you have places that you can download onto your computer and copy and color Mary and other goddesses. So on some of these web pages, they show Mary, the mother of Jesus, and they'll give it for little children so that they can take it and color it. And so it's a lethal stuff. And if you get into this type of occult practices, you can really be on dangerous ground. Even the ordinary practice in the Catholic Church of praying to saints can be disastrous. I have one sister who lost her baby daughter, Susan, very early on. The baby was suffocated. I never saw the baby. I was in the priory at the time as a Dominican, just preparing for the priesthood. I never saw Susan. Susan was suffocated and died. And my sister was very deeply disturbed, as you well might imagine. But then later on in her life, a Jesuit came to her and told her that she could pray to Susan and get comfort. 
and in that way she could address Susan, her daughter, in prayer, just as you address, you know, the saints. And that is really an avenue into the occult. And we have to be really aware of these things, that it's lethal. It was a real heartbreak to me in 96 when I was talking to this sister to say that she got comfort from this. And real heartbreak because this is the avenue into the occult. In the pages of scripture we address only God alone. We pray only to God and Christ Jesus. And prayers are addressed to none other from cover to cover of the Bible, you would think that this is primary, basic truth. This is ABC. And where you get people really looking to others, we are on highly dangerous ground, highly dangerous terrain. It is frightening that though the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 that Satan is transformed into an angel of light it is frightening when you see it happening and when you see it happening in different parts of the world even here in the USA it is frightening it's one thing to read in the pages of scripture that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. But it's another thing to see it in practice. We had quoted from the Catholic upholding of Lourdes of, as an apparition to Bernadette in the 19th century and it is still a site where many Catholics go, Lourdes, the Shrine of Lourdes, to pray to Mary and to have communication with her who appeared there. I went there as a Catholic priest on my way back from Rome. I was horrified by Rome and the immorality of the city, which is supposed to be the holy city. And I left early without doing too high-flying theological degrees because of the pain and agony I was having um, in Rome itself because I'd always look forward to being in Rome and coming back from Rome I stopped at Lourdes it was like to purify myself and get back to traditional Catholicism as I knew it from a young boy in Ireland and I decided I'd go to the grotto at Lourdes to do penance because Mary is always saying you've got to do penance because many souls go to hell because there's nobody to pray and do penances for them. That is a direct quotation from another apparition site, Fatima. So I decided to go to Lourdes, southern Italy. I entered into the processions, the candlelight processions, thousands upon thousands of Catholics from all over the world and then I went to the grotto where it's claimed that people are healed and you would see the wheelchairs there and you'd see the crutches that people have left behind after the healings and you would see the baths where people go into to be healed and I went and I looked at one of these baths and people were going down into it to be healed and it was full and sort of dirty with water but there was some mucus membrane in it because some people would go in with open wounds or cancerous wounds and it was not some place you would like to go but I went into the pool not to be healed but to do penance I took the water up in my hand and I drank it trusting Mary to keep me from any illness or sickness and to do a penance, to suffer for my sins and the sins of the world in what she said at that apparition and in all her apparitions. Now, that was one of the more horrendous things I've ever done. 
even the thought of it, but the taste of it, and it was in my mouth and stomach without remaining a day, was one of the more horrendous penances I've ever done. But I was doing it under the belief that Mary could preserve me and that my sufferings would add to Christ's sufferings to save the world. And that is the message of Fatima, the message of Lourdes. The message of Denver, Colorado, of Mary's apparitions in Denver, Colorado. To Nancy Fowler in Conyers, just outside Atlanta, in Lubbock, Texas. There's practically not a state in America where we have had not had apparitions, but I named some of the more famous ones that are quite well known. The most famous possibly being Medjugorje, where Americans go in Bosnia, where the Croats control the shrine and the Franciscan friars who fight for Croats, you know, the Croats, the, the values of Catholicism, they are the ones who have the shrine where Mary was supposed to have appeared with the same message of suffering. It is really sad that many Americans come back from Medjugorje with damaged retina because they look up into the sun because that is one of the things that was proclaimed at Medjugorje that the sun would dance and the sun would come down from the earth and the children of Medjugorje saw the sun dance. And so Catholics going there looking at the sun, it no longer dances like it did for the children, but they're looking to it and some come back with damaged retina. Particularly it has been documented in the southern states of America, but right across Catholics have gone to Medjugorje to suffer. American Catholics are not big into suffering, but some of them go to Medjugorje to try and make up for their sins by suffering at least for, you know, a week or so, and then coming back and hoping that you've stored up some merits, you know, to your account. But it is really sad, because that's the message of Satan. And this is where Satan shows himself as an angel of light. And these apparitions are really popular. There's more DVDs, videos, and books on the apparitions of Mary than any other subject. It's where modern American Catholics live. When I was in Boyne City in Michigan, I was giving a talk. We had rented a hall because we couldn't get a Bible-believing church to have me there. We rented a hall where I spoke. Many Catholics came and when I spoke about Mary being the All-Holy One, one Catholic lady stood up and she said, yes, she is the All-Holy One, not a All-Holy One, it's the definite article, the All-Holy One, and she appears right across the world and here in America. She was proud that she had the All-Holy One who appeared and told her what to do. We had a about 30 of them there who were very much in love with this Mary, not simply in the pages of the Catechism as the all Holy one, but the one who was demonstrating the reality of who she is in apparitions here in America and across the world. And this is really serious because this is where a lot of American Catholicism is lived. They are fascinated by the apparitions, fascinated with the idea that we have a religion where things are happening. People are healed. There's a demonstration of power. People come away different. People leave their crutches behind and their wheelchairs behind. And we have a demonstration of who this one is that we pray to. Now the Bible talks about signs and lying wonders. We are warned of signs and lying wonders. We are warned about the sun coming down from heaven and dancing. 
We are warned about the false prophet who would uphold Catholicism and suffering for sin. We are warned about this in the page of Scripture. But most Bible believers are looking for some future time when these things will happen. And they will not buy the Catholic videos which will show you the exact same things. The sun dancing at Fatima and Medjugorje coming down from heaven. Exact fulfillment of what the pages of scripture said. There will be signs and lying wonders. And people looking to some future uh, happening of these things and where all you've got to do is buy a Catholic video and see what scripture had said would happen and have some heart for people who are tied up in this because this is a most serious hold because it's like Satan has his claws on your very heart and in your mind that you can suffer for sinners. I say this with feeling because as a Catholic boy and later on in the Dominican Priory where I was studying for the priesthood, I memorized what Mary said at Fatima. Pray and do sacrifices for many souls go to hell because there's nobody to pray or do penance for them. I memorized that and I lived it. When I was preparing for the priesthood, I would have cold showers in the midst of winter and stand till my bones like nearly cracked in the cold, standing under the cold shower to feel pain till I could bear it no longer and I'd come out. Why? So that souls would not go to hell. They one day would reach purgatory and then finally heaven. I was suffering because Mary told me, not Mary, but the, the one who claimed to be Mary. I know I lived it. I, at one stage, and I didn't do it for very long, but at one stage I got permission from the master of students to make a little whip, a little steel whip, where I took off my Dominican habit and my undershirt and I flagellated myself. I beat myself. I didn't do it to blood like the saints had done in the, in, the, in the books I read and I was really annoyed that I didn't do it till I bled. I did it till I couldn't bear the pain any longer. Because I was living out the teaching that many souls go to hell because there's nobody to pray or do penance for them. That is a negation of the one sacrifice of Christ. That he only suffered for the sin. And that's why the apparitions, Medjugorje, Fatima, Lubbock, Texas, Denver, Colorado, and Conyers, Atlanta are all so evil because they're teaching another gospel. And the Mary that appears is not Mary because she asks for adulation and worship and prayer. That is not the Mary of the Bible. The Mary of the Bible is humble of heart and she does not focus attention on herself. Whatever he says to you, do, do it. She focused her attention on Christ. And when Christ sometimes appears, it is always as the dead Christ in the lap of Mary or the infant Jesus. So, we do not have a biblical portrayal, anything but. We have a damaging, soul-rendering, grievous misleading of precious people. And this is happening across the world. We have a book on the table, and if you can't get it, you'll be able to get it on an online catalog very soon, called Graven Bread by William... Uh, by... Um, Timothy Kaufman. Timothy Kaufman was a devout Catholic and into the apparitions. He's a NASA scientist and when he got saved he wrote to explain what happens in the apparitions. And it is an eye-opening book. You will not leave it down. Grave and Bread by Timothy Kaufman. His first book was Quite Contrary where he documents also the apparitions and how lethal it is to Catholic life for somebody who got into it. But he was into it deeply, personally himself, 
and he got out. Praise God. And he has a web page and he has written these books and I would really ask that you check him out, Timothy Kaufman, because he has done tremendous research and he gives you the exact words like of Nancy Fowler on what happened in, in, in Denver, Colorado. He gives you the exact words of the apparitions and he shows you what scripture says. And this is needed because we have here really uh, before our eyes the exact opposite to what we should have. The finished work of Christ Jesus and the gospel. In the pages of scripture when he had by himself purged the sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty and high. We have one saviour who did one work and who is full of grace and is the only cause of salvation in the love of the Father and this is the one to whom you look. So you can get out beyond all of this. How? Look to him for life. There is none other name given under heaven by which we may be saved. None other name. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one cometh to the Father except through me. And the glorious thing is that there are many of us who were Catholic priests and nuns and Catholics. And the glorious thing is that many of us have come to salvation. And that is my word to you today. As a precious Catholic person, look to him and he will gloriously save you. And you will say in the words of Ephesians, with joy in your heart, as you receive salvation in his name and in his work, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God.